1980s, Ian Bishop was a midfielder who played for City. He actually had two spells at City. But after he left the Blues, he went on to West Ham, where he met up with another former City player, Trevor Morley. They played together in the same team for a little while. But then, as you'll see in this video that's coming up now, an incident happened which led to suggestions that Trevor Morley and Ian Bishop were gay. Now, you may have seen the interview I did with Trevor Morley, uh, which has already been on YouTube on my Trevor Blue channel. I'm going to show you a little bit of it again, and then you'll hear what Ian Bishop had to say in reply. The most notorious thing that people talk about when they talk about you, apart from the goal and everything like that, was you've been involved in a stabbing incident. What was the truth behind that? Were you involved in something like that? Yeah, well, my wife stabbed me, my first wife. Um... Basically, she was psychopath, really. She's a crazy woman. And um, the story, of course, Bish is involved with this. <laughs> me and Bish was, uh, me. <laughs> got into a bit of trouble. I won't tell the exact story, but anyway, um, ends up that uh, I had a fight with her. Not a fight, but she started attacking me. And I used to keep a knife in my drawer at the side of my bed. And she threw the drawer, she threw this cabinet at me and the knife fell out and then she go to stab me and it's it's not easy to stop someone stabbing you funny enough because I actually stopped the first couple, one it went in my arm, the first one, and then it went through into my side. And um I mean, I'd been drinking it the funny thing it didn't hurt, but the blood started spraying out. And I thought maybe I'm going to die here. And and I ran I ran to my neighbour. It was like two thirty in the morning, just outside London. He was a from Croatia, a great guy, and he was laughing because I was just had my shorts on. He went, Trevor, what's up? I went, I've been stabbed, and the blood was coming out. And then I collapsed. I didn't remember anything else. So um, yeah, it's a true story. I lost four and a half pints of blood, very close to dying. Um, and uh, next thing I woke up, 6.30 in the morning, Billy Bonds was there and the people from West Ham. And yeah, I was just glad to be alive. But it's a true story. And of course, the rumours that followed that because the newspapers were on to me like crazy. And I was living on my own and just outside London. And the Sunday newspapers especially was like, oh, we know your wife found you in bed with another girl and blah, blah, blah. And my lawyer said, don't make a comment. Do not make a comment. Because you make a comment, you'll be in the newspaper. There was no comment, no comment. And this went on. So eventually they were saying, uh, we, we've heard your wife found you in bed with another man. And I was like, I wanted to punch the guy, you know, but I was like, no comment. And then eventually they said, oh, we've heard you've been caught in bed with Ian Bishop. And where that comes story come from, I don't know. Uh, maybe it was her that said the story to try and justify it. We also know an ex-player that didn't like Bish. I'm not going to mention his name. Played for a few big clubs, may have started the rumour. But the amazing thing was, this never, it never went to the newspaper. By word of mouth, in two days, when this story, well, when people start talking, it went from London to Nottingham. My sister rang me and said, What's, I said, the same you was in bed with Ian Bish. <laughs> And we were laughing, you know, at first. And we thought it was funny until, you know, we walked in the pub and, and we were nearly fighting with people and then we started playing again and we got the gay songs. So it was a tough time. I was drinking for most of the season that season. Bish took it a bit better than me, but, you know, and I actually... <laughs> I there's some funny stories. I actually lived with Bish and his wife for a while because, you know, I was on my own. And... Uh, there was one, I think it was a Saturday morning, and his wife went down to make a cup of tea and said, I'll bring the papers up. And I got in bed with Bish, sat there re reading the newspapers. The window cleaner suddenly has appeared at the window, looked through the window and seen me and Bish in a double bed, sitting, lying, reading the Sunday papers, which was uh, funny, really. So so we, we, we're cool with it now. We laugh about it. but And it was tough for a time because, you know, played at Old Trafford when they were singing songs about us for 20 minutes. And um, yeah, and Bish actually dropped his shorts to the Stratford end. 
which I said to Bish, that wasn't your best move. He showed his arse to the threat for them. Now I that that wasn't a good move, but so we're, we're best best mates. We're we're, we're still best mates, and um, of course, we was at Man City together. And for my deal, I mean, okay, I was a bit older, but to get rid of Bish, he was a fantastic player. Uh, he was really upset and annoyed about the rumours, more so because of the song that they sang. I mean, I don't know what words I'm allowed to use on this, mate, but the song went, who's up Morley's ass, Ian Bishop is. And he said, I was really upset with that, the fact that it wasn't, who's up Bishop's ass. Jeff <laughs> Morley said, why have I got to be the taker? <laughs> so, you know, that was his, that was his, start, his opening words, mate. And then, and then he said, look, Hang fire till the end of the show and you'll find out whether we were gay or not. So he's doing it like a friggin' like a TV show where, uh, a soap opera where <laughs> they'll give you a little teaser at the front but you'll have to watch every episode and find out the answer. Well, you know, mate, it was, it was, it was utterly ridiculous, cheesy, you know. We're good friends. I can't even, I can't even see where it's come from. I really don't. Looking back. The, the effect that it had on, on him and his family and me and my family, it, was, it, it should never have happened. Um, you know, you deal with it as best you can. And I dealt, I dealt with it with, with laughter and comedy. And um, I must admit, some nights it wasn't laughter and comedy. Some nights when you're out having a beer, it, it could have got nasty. But, um, you know, I think it, it, it hit him hard because it, I think it affected his career a little bit. You know, um, Whereas I went blowing kisses to the to the thugs who were shouting at me, cheesy. It was, you know, I, I took it as if they're trying to put me off my game, whatever way they they know I can hurt them. So, in a way, it was a it was a compliment, it was a backhanded compliment to me. So, um, I, I just I just can't believe that people actually thought like that, and thought that that like the homophobia side of it was something that they could get at you with. Um, just the ignorance of people was was what I couldn't understand. Um, and, and you look, I mean, it, it's probably had an adverse effect on players today who maybe are gay, but, but are so fearful of, of, of opening up and coming out and saying it for, for the, the abuse that they might take, you know I mean? And I, and I can imagine it won't just be with fans, it, it may be with, with footballers as well. I mean, I don't want to go back and, and throw names out there, but, but I, was, I was abused by players also, cheesy. Players on the pitch, little snidey comments and stuff, you know. Um, two very prominent players, in fact. Um, you know, I won't go that far, but one of them ended up managing Man City. So, um, it was it's just one of them things. And, and, you know, something like that happens. The next thing I want to do, I want to side you down around the knees or the, or the thighs. You know, I'm, you, you know, I'm going to come for you and let you know. I, you can say what you want. I'll show you who I am. And the majority of times, mate, I did it with me football anyway. I'd like to think. Uh, I showed them, I taught them lessons, you know, out on the field with my game. And, um, you know, it, it was just, it was surprising that it was coming from the mouth of players who obviously knew, knew me or knew of me through other people and knew how much bullshit it was, to be honest with you, mate. You know. I know, I know you're a joker and I know that you can take this sort of thing on the chin. But actually, uh, the story that you've just told me there is, a, is an interesting one in the times that we live in because obviously it is a very serious matter. And as you already pointed out, footballers need to be able to be what they are. And fans need to be what they are. So you're making a very serious point here, really, aren't you? I am, mate. Well, well it was. And, and I know we're talking, what, what year was it? 1991. And it, and it lasted all the way through the 90s. And, you know, people, even now, we're still talking about it cheesy, you know? So... It's. I think we're still talking about it because of the way everything's changed and society's changed. It should be. It should be okay now for people to open up. You know, you're still going to get the old school. You still. You you can't clear everybody's mind and, and have a complete washout and say this is how you should think now. You're still going to get and it, and it's not their fault. You know, the people from back in the day. It's it's difficult to change people's outlook and and the way they are. But just don't say nothing. You know, it doesn't matter what you feel. Everybody's allowed to feel what they feel. You know, you don't necessarily have to express it all the time. Unless people want you to, unless people are asking you. But people tend to, to um, be full of their own self-importance and say, this is how I feel, I'm going to say it. There's no need if nobody's asked you, is there? 
you know, it's the social media aspect of things now. Everybody's got an opinion. Everybody's got a view. Everybody's got a YouTube channel. Everybody wants to be famous. And, and it works for some people, you know, that they have become famous because of it. But um, I don't want to hear it. It's like sometimes on Twitter, you know, you, you have your Twitter account for, for your opinion. I don't go on there to have a conversation with someone or a discussion or a dispute. I say, this is my opinion. Somebody will come back and say, why do you think that? Or, or, well, don't you think this? Well, I haven't followed you and asked you about your opinion. You know, I'm just putting it out there. And, and, and you sort of get caught up uh, with the responsibility to answer people. I like, I like interacting with people, but only about the right things. You know what I mean? It's, I don't want to have an argument on there. I straight away, mate, if I get a Man United fan coming on my Twitter site, block. Because I know what they're there for. You know what I mean? And, and I must have about 150 people blocked. And that's it. There's probably not a lot in the scheme of things. But I don't think there's one that isn't a Man United fan. Because that's all they come on with. Oh, Trevor Morley. And I'm thinking, are you still stuck in a time warp? You know what I mean? You're, you're still accusing me when the amount of stuff that's been out there I was, I was annoyed with one of the newspapers recently, mate, because I did a, um, I did a podcast or, or with, with somebody and I answered some of them questions. Next thing you know, there's headlines in one of the newspapers. And I never gave that interview. And then now that they've took it, they can put their own. It wasn't a bad one, don't get me wrong. It wasn't accusing me of anything. I mean, it did come out and, and make me look a little bit like, oh, I didn't play for England because of the gay rumours. That's not what I said. I'm saying, the question was, did it affect your chances? And I'm saying it, it did play a part, I feel. And I only know that because Billy Bonds told me, the England managers at the time asked about it. And then I wasn't involved in the next B squad. That's all I said. The reason I didn't play for England was David Batty, Paul Gascoigne, Matt Letizia. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not dumb enough to think I should have been in in front of them type of people. So I'm not going to say that. I'm saying, did it affect my chances of playing in the next England B squad? Of course it did. Would that have affected my chances of maybe graduating to the full squad? Of course it does. But when they just take a little snippet from somebody else's podcast and stick it out there, it annoys me, mate. And I, I remember writing a nasty tweet about it. And, and, and then I woke up the next day and I went, why am I doing that? Why am I even bothered? Because you're not going to stop it. If I choose to say, yeah, I'll do somebody's podcast, I'm doing it out of the goodness of my heart. Jeez, I don't get paid. You know, I don't think I ever have, to be honest with you. You know, I'm one of them people, and you'll know yourself. It's, you ask me to do it, I'll, I'll come on and do it. You know, it's, I'm that type of person, but when somebody else wants to take it to, to fill a space in the newspaper, it does me head in a little bit, especially when it's something personal like that. You know, and it's making me look as if, oh, I would, it's me saying I would have played for England if it wasn't for them rumours. That's not what I said. It's not what I said. I'm saying it had an effect. Did it have an effect? It must have for them to ask and for Billy Bonds to tell me, oh, don't go public with it. I've told you in, in, you know, in privacy. This is the phone call he had. Because it was him who phoned them. Billy Bonds phoned them and said, why is he not in the next squad? And they gave him that answer along with, they don't like me here and I don't score enough goals. The third one was, what are these gay rumours? So it was Billy Bonds telling me, it wasn't me. And I just said, Bill, if that's the way they think, then fuck them then. And in no uncertain terms, I play for West Ham. And that's it. I can only be judged on what I do for West Ham at that time. And I got picked because of it. And then, you know, I didn't get picked for various reasons. Me hair, really? Is that why you don't play for England? I don't get enough goals before one more game where I didn't score. So all the games before, when they picked me, now all of a sudden that's a factor when I wasn't a natural goal scorer anyway. So it, it tells me, you know, I think anyone with any common sense, if they're asking that question, will, will lead to believe that it must have had something to do with it. And only to do with why I wasn't picked in the next B squad. That's all I was really saying, you know. And I just remember when I look back, I see you have somebody like Glenn Hoddle, right? I remember Glenn doing an article, and Glenn was one of my heroes. I remember doing an article saying, I think it was me, Ian Crook and Vinnie Samways were all playing in the Premier League at the time. And I think he came out and said something like, England players should go on a five-mile run before a game because then they may slow down and pass the ball around. And then he named in the papers me 
Vinny and Ian Kruger's being the only real playmakers to fit that bill at that time. Which, for somebody like Glenn Hoddle, who was an England manager as well, he perceived that, you know, I may have been good enough to have been given a chance. Well, you know, it, it is what it is, mate. It's, um, it's a long time gone now. Jeez, you know me. <laughs> 